By the way, Jimmy, I have a complaint for you because my daughter is addicted to your chips now. <laughs> there's, there's a box of them right over there, so make sure you can grab them. Every time we go to Costco, I have to get those chips. I mean, I like them, you know, but I think I, I told her we should buy stock in a Hawaiian chip company. You're killing me with them. My name is Rob Hack. I'm on the board of directors of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. We're a local nonprofit based here at the Foreign Trade Zone. Um, we are all volunteers, and we were appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce in order to be on the board. And it is our job to teach small companies about exporting. And the topic today will be international trade shows and sort of what to do at an international trade show, how to prepare for it, a little bit about what to do while you're there, and then how to follow up after the trade show and close those deals. So we have a, a really big uh, panel put together today with lots of uh, people who have tremendous amount of experience at trade shows uh, around the world. We tend to talk about Japan when we do our um, seminars here because most of the Hawaii companies, when they're interested in exporting, they think about Japan first. And so I think some of the presentations you'll see today will be um, somewhat Japan focused, but I want you to be able to translate anything that you see today outside of Japan and think about Korea or China or Germany or Brazil or wherever you happen to be um, going on a trade show, right? As we'll hear in a minute from Jamie Lum at DBET, that DBET has um, specified certain trade shows that they think are really important and you can take part in those trade shows um, if you apply. and. Um, you can at attend and be in the pavilions and what have you, but you could certainly attend trade shows through the High Step program or not through the High Step program, completely on your own, that have um, nothing to do with the trade shows that DBET has uh, picked. So for example, um, I know some companies here that are going to a trade show in um, Brazil pretty soon. So you could translate the things that we'll go over today um, into attending a trade show in Brazil, for example. I will try to point out to you some of the best practices and things you should think about uh, to prepare for going to a trade show. Um, certainly, uh, we're not going to cover in here things like um, if you go to a trade show in Brazil, you need to get um, a yellow fever inoculation, okay? We don't cover that part. Um, if you go to Japan, you don't need a yellow fever inoculation. But those are just kind of the things that we won't cover. But the kind of things that we will cover will be the materials to prepare, um, to the customs uh, and um, cultural topics you could think about while you're preparing for the show, what to do, how to behave at the booth. Some of the things are common sense, but I think some of the things are a good reminder um, about what to do while you're at an international trade show booth. So um, back to HPEC, we are able to put on these seminars every year due to a generous grant we receive from DBET. Um, and so Jamie Lum is going to talk to us a little bit about DBET. While she's coming up, let me explain. In this current cycle of our seminars for 2018, we have one more left. After this, it's June 14th, and it's on exporting of services. It's the first time we've ever done that topic. That's um, such as architecture, engineering services, uh, that kind of thing, which is actually um, a growing and very significant export um, area for Hawaii. So we've been asked to try to put together a program based on that. Okay, so Jamie, if you could come up and talk about the High Step program in general. Thank you. Aloha, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for all being here. I uh, just want to give you a little background on our High Step program, of which this seminar is a part of. Uh, High Step is for the Hawaii State Trade Expansion Program, and we are able to put the program together through a grant that we get from the Small Business Administration. So 
um, to carry out the programs under High Step, we do engage many partners. HPEC is one of them. Patsy Mink, Terry is up here. Small Business Development Centers with Joe and Lori. Um, Hideki with the Department of Ag, uh, as well as Foreign Trade Zone. They allow us to hold seminars here and, our, uh, and the um, Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. So many, many partners that we work together with. Um, basically, the elements of our high step, well, the purpose of a high step program is to get more of our Hawaii companies exporting. And for those that are already exporting, to get you to uh, increase your export sales. So um, what we do is we have uh, several elements. We have our training and export readiness uh, uh, component of the program, which is what this seminar is a part of. Uh, we do the seminars. Our partners do a lot of one-on-one -on -one business advising. Um, we encourage companies, whether or not you participate in any of the trade shows that either DBED participates or you don't do any trade shows at all, but you just want to learn a lot more about exporting if you're brand new or even if you're not brand new, to uh, attend uh, the seminars and to work with some of our partner organizations to help you in developing your export strategy. So that's one. Um, trying to build a pipeline of companies. Um, the second component, um, and Rob already um, alluded to this is our Hawaii pavilions. We do designate certain trade shows that we support, so the funds that we have are used to basically pay for uh, the cost of the trade show. Uh, companies pay a little bit of a participation fee to participate, but certainly not the amount of money that you would spend if you went into a trade show on your own. And uh, we do this all under the, the Hawaii brand, so, um, and I know that um, there are some photos right there like of the Tokyo International Gift Show, which is one of the largest shows that we organize and which is coming up in September. So we have a calendar of those shows. We are already uh, well into 2018 actually for High Step. So uh, although we do have a couple, we have TIGs coming up in September. We also are doing the Outdoor Retailer Show uh, in Denver, which is an international show for outdoor um, activities uh, and, and um, companies and products related to that. So we do have a few more for a few more events coming up. Um, we are in the process right now of actually applying for another grant. So hopefully we will continue to get funds from SBA so that we can carry on into the end of 2018 and, and into 2019. Um, so Hawaii Pavilions is our second component. And our final component is our financial assistance um, component where companies can actually apply directly to us. It is on a competitive basis, but based on your export plan, we look at what you're, um, what you're intending to do and you can get some funds to, um, to carry out various aspects of your export plan. So for instance, Rob mentioned that if there is another trade show that you want to do that is not one that DBED does, this is the program you could uh, apply to and um, in your export strategy explain why you're going into that market, why you want to go to this show and so forth. Um, so that's just a quick rundown of High Step. If you go to our website, which is invest.hawaii.gov, under the exporting tab, it gives you all of the details of High Step. And as we move along, and we um, we probably we normally find out in September whether or not we get another round of funding. So once we find that out, then we start you know putting up all the new information for next year and so forth. So just um, you know check our website every now and then. We we do a pretty good job of keeping it updated with the latest information. And uh, we'll be around. Uh, my DBED colleagues are here as well. We all, we are all part of the program. Um, so if you have any questions at the end of the program, you can always see one of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, let me say there's really two parts of the program today. One, there'll be some speakers that will come up and talk about their vast experience um, attending trade shows. And then we'll have later, those speakers will be on a panel, but we'll have some other panelists who will join us and offer a broad range of perspectives. So um, we'll have Q&A later. I think, um, Pris, you have to leave fairly early, so uh, we'll have you speak first, and then people will ask Pris questions, and then she has to run off. So she, she'll be the only person here who won't be on the panel. Okay, before I bring up Pris, I need to go through, make sure I do the disclaimer so that everybody understands. This is a public forum. Um, it's being uh, live streamed out to the neighbor islands live. 
and we're recording it for posterity. It'll go onto our YouTube channel eventually. So your face may be on YouTube and any question you ask will be part of the public record and any answers that are given to those questions. Okay, so please understand that going in. Okay, with that being said, let me jump in and um, just bring up Pr Pris Tashera. She's the managing director of the Hawaii Tourism Global MCI, which is uh, marketing conventions and meetings, conventions and incentives. Thank you. Let me bring up your presentation quickly. Start for a okay. Aloha kakahiaka. Thank you very much Aloha. for having me here this morning to share a little bit about uh, what we do with trade shows. I actually, uh, you know, the Hawaii Tourism Authority covers everything related to tourism. I'm only in the market segment, which is uh, internationally referred to as the MICE market. Meetings, incentives, conferences, conventions, and uh, events. So it's global events that we deal with. We attend our industry trade shows all over the world annually. We're very fortunate in that we have in market all over the world uh, Hawaii Tourism global contractors that are in market promoting tourism for uh, promoting bringing visitors to Hawaii. As part of this, in most of these countries, we have one person at least designated, designated specifically for the mice market. So every year in the fall, we go through a calendar of what is happening for the upcoming year, and we decide which shows we're going to go to, which trade industry trade shows we're going to go to, and what, uh, who's going to participate with us. And we rely very much on our in-market contractors and partners to help us put this together because they know better than anyone else what it is about the customs of that particular country, how people communicate, and what they're looking for, and how we stand out compared to everybody else. So, we do uh, all of those um, different things. And uh, one of the things that we do is to be sure that whatever trade show we attend, there are two very important things. One, that we stand out. And two, that we are authentic Hawaii. We don't... Uh, use or give out anything that's made in China or whatever. Everything we do and we give out as giveaways is Hawaii. Uh, even our uh, uniforms, such as this, you know, this is Iolani, and we're sure that we represent Hawaii in the best most authentic way that we can for this. Mm -hmm. And some of the uh, shows, I'll just quickly go through some of this here so you can see some of the setups that we have. A lot of our shows have, uh, it's twofold. One, it's uh, booth setups that people walk by your booths and, you know, because they're interested in it. And now the trend in the mice market trade shows is that there's always an appointment 
component to it, that when you sign up for a show, you can sign up for appointments with whomever you want to that is attending the show. And those customers can also request appointments with you. So we have, you know, those sort of things. The one big show we do in Canada is the Incentives Works Canada, and that's what we did last um, September. And, okay, next one. Let's see what the next one is. IMAX America is probably the biggest mice trade show that we participate in. At this show, we have 65 Hawaii companies that have booths. So we have 65 booths within the Hawaii Pavilion. And the people who attend, uh, the people who make, the, make up this, um, the attendance, are the hotels, airlines, uh, amenity companies, uh, ground transportation companies, event planning companies. So those are the people that participate. At this IMEX America, over 75% of the buyers are US. And the other 25% are from Asia, from Canada, and also some from Europe. So that's the biggest one for the whole mice market. And you can see here the staff that's wearing the uniforms there, that is the actual HVCB, we call them HTUSA, Meet Hawaii Team. These are the salespeople for the USA mice market. And again, they're all in uniforms. Okay, next one. I am leaving first thing tomorrow morning for Frankfurt to go to IMEX Frankfurt. And there at IMEX Frankfurt, over 60% of the buyers come from all over Europe. And the other 40% come from Asia and the United States. I go to IMAX, although we have a sales team there in uh, Europe, a MICE sales team, with me will be a representative for the Hawaii Convention Center and a representative from Hilton and also a representative from MCNA, which is a ground operating company. And I go there because I represent the Asian uh, mice people for Hawaii, so that there's somebody there that can communicate with them and talk to them about who they need to follow up with in the Asian countries. And next, uh, next one is, okay, AIM is this big show in Melbourne, Australia. And this is basically geared to Asia Pacific uh, buyers who go to Australia. And at AIM, it's almost 100% Australian destinations that are promoting themselves. But we go there because there are a lot of Asian and Oceania buyers there. So that's a pretty big show for us. Next one. And this Tourism Expo Japan, it's probably the biggest show for travel in general from Japan to Hawaii. And, you know, there's a very large contingent from Hawaii, about 30 different companies that go to uh, this thing, and it's, it's the big show for the Japan market, not just mice, it's more for leisure travel, all kinds of different travel uh, to Hawaii, the buyers to Hawaii. Okay, 
and the next one. And then this is the same thing uh, in China, though. And China is a really growing market for us. Uh, you know, there's lots of visitors, but we can't expect to get, um, you know, it's not a big, big market for us. It's a very targeted market for us because there's lots of issues like uh, visas and, uh, you know, the flights. We don't have as many flights coming into Hawaii as they do to Las Vegas or to Los Angeles or other Asia and Oceania. But you can see from these pictures that each of the booths setups are very much Hawaii, but related to that particular country and the messaging and what have you, huh? Okay. And I wanted to share with you this morning um, this video that we, uh, that Oahu Economic Development uh, produced for uh, APEC. You know, APEC was here in 2011. And this video has been the most uh, popular video requested by MICE clients about Hawaii. You know, the whole world knows Hawaii as a world-class leisure destination. Just as that makes us so popular, it's a challenge for us to promote Hawaii as a business destination, as a place where you should come and meet in Hawaii and connect with the local people and how you get business done in Hawaii because it's known so much as a leisure destination. So I just wanted you to get a little feel for how we promote Hawaii as a place to do business. Square miles. 2,200 miles from the nearest continent. Islands continually emerging from the center of the earth. Our ancestors, carried by the waves and guided by the stars, came to this place, searching for the promise of our highest valued commodity, pure water, and we found the wettest spot on earth. We found the house of the sun to observe her set and to watch her rise. The finest place to view the heavens and study the stars. The luscious forests to develop the finest land management and resource system in history. Our people are known as Hawaiians. In time, others began to discover these islands. Our people came to this place from another island in the Pacific. We came to work on a plantation and looking for a better life. We came with our beliefs, our heritage, foods, and values. We came from Japan. We came to this place from a very large place, traveling to a very small place. Like everyone who came, we came looking for a better life. We came from China. We came to this place from a country far away. We came to help on the plantation and with horses. We also came with our traditions and beliefs. We came from Portugal. We came to this place looking for opportunity, 
We came to work on the plantation. We also brought our beliefs, heritage, music, foods, and dances. We came to this place from the Philippines. And people came from every nation and every nationality. My ancestors came to this place, and I am Hawaiian, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, Filipino, Puerto Rican, Blackfoot, and Cherokee. Our ancestors came to this place, and we are Hawaii. His grandparents came to this place with his mother, and his father came to this place. He was born in this place, and he is the President of the United States. And born in this place were innovations both ancient and modern. More than a thousand years before any other, aquaculture fed hundreds of thousands. Hula are stories told in chant and dance. Heinalu is something we have loved for centuries. You know it is surfing, now a $20 billion business. Also born in this place, the first cold storage ship, the first modern resort, container shipping in the Pacific and U.S., and the Verifone credit card clearing machine, which still dominates the smart card and wireless device business worldwide. And born in this place was a computer code named Aloha. This code connects us to every computer, wireless phone, Wi-Fi, or satellite. Every time you press send on your wireless phone or connect to the internet, the first thing sent is Aloha, because Aloha connects. These and countless more inventions and innovations were born in this place to care for the children and to contribute to the world. Today, the world is in crisis looking for solutions. Solutions to care for our natural resources, to produce clean energy, to feed every child and to provide them education, to resolve religious, geographic, and political conflicts, and to eradicate disease. We need your help. We need the world to come. We need to connect to develop solutions. We invite you to experience Hawaii, Ha, the breath, the air, the atmosphere, the energy, Vai the fresh water which feeds and cleanses our lands, nourishes our bodies and all living things. E, short for Io, the creator, who connects us, our breath, our water, and all things. Hawaii, more than a location, a description of the basic resources of this world. Air, water, land, life, to care for all children. In November 2011, Hawaii is hosting the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. We invite you to look beyond the very few days of APEC and join us as we aloha the future for our children and grandchildren. The
spirit of my ancestors, aloha, embrace you always with affection. Aloha. So I hope you enjoyed that little thing, but I have to tell you that at a lot of these trade shows, we have within our pavilion uh, a room where we can do presentations uh, to groups of people of up to like 20 people. And when we talk, up, when we, our audience are people who are the decision makers who make the selection on where their world congresses will be going to. This is the most popular video. This is the one thing that touches them, that really communicates who we are, you know, uh, if they can't come here firsthand and experience the destination. It is through a uh, trade shows and things like this video that we were able to bring the uh, IUCN's World Conservation Congress that was here in 2016. So those are the kinds of things that we do from a tourism standpoint, specifically for the mice market. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Please, anybody. Yes? When you say uh, you have companies participating, at what capacity are they participating? To promote themselves, or are they promoting this platform, like, hey, this is how you're going to get to Hawaii, and this is the experience you're going to see? We, Hawaii Tourism Authority, our people are the ones that uh, promote the destination. Uh, how you get here, what is available here, why you should come to this destination. The other people that are there are specifically to promote their product. Like Hilton uh, will promote all of Hilton hotels in Hawaii, you know. So come to Hawaii because this is what we have to offer you. And then the specifics for individual products are by the people who participate with us. And these are generally, I mean, I imagine larger companies in Hawaii, um, but what, to get an idea of scope, what, what, who would be the smallest company uh, We have, uh, Companies like uh, um, Current Affairs, which is an event company here, and they put on um, events at Iolani Palace. They put on events for uh, local companies, and it's a small company. I believe they only have like uh, less than a dozen full-time employees, but they have... Uh, contracted freelance employees that they use for the different uh, programs. Uh, we have DMC companies that have like only four or five people, and then they have contract uh, employees for when they put on the events. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the big companies, you know. We also have amenity companies, and amenity companies, they have like two or three people, and, um, but they promote whatever amenities they represent, you know, different things like that. Little sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, sorry, just one last question. Um, if a company in Hawaii wants to check out a show, Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, you can go on the HTA website. So on the HTA website, uh, it's all only tourism-related shows. 
you know, if you wanted other shows, then I believe you could go to um, Jamie's website to, to see what other trade shows they participate in, huh? Yeah, because, you know, because that um, Japan, the Japan show is kind of not that close to the gift show, but around that area, so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, what you can do is go to the Hawaii Tourism site, and then you can see, uh, you can click on to uh, Hawaii Tourism Japan, and they are the ones that organize it. Uh, or you can call the Hawaii Tourism Office here on Oahu and ask for Chika. Chika is the brand manager for Japan, and she can tell you all about it. Yes, uh-huh. Who goes and, uh, you know, what you can expect. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I will leave some of my cards here. Just pick up my card if you have anything, and if I can help you in any way with any of these trade shows, you know, connect you to the right people. Okay, and I also brought uh, this little thing here, <laughs> this little journal that I call my little trade show journal that we give out to certain shows. Um, and it's really good because you can take notes right at the booth and there's stickums and whatever, huh? So please help yourself to one of these, okay, as a little souvenir of you're coming out here this morning to learn a little bit about trade shows. And thank you very much for having me come. Mahalo. That was great. Thank you again, Pris. Um, a couple of things I, w I just wanted to point out. She has some good photos in here. Um, later, we might get a little bit into the weeds on some of these topics, but I'm trying to understand um, myself some of the topics that we're doing on trade shows and looking at this you can see can you see maybe with the lights it's difficult but this background here is all curtains and that's a hard way to hang posters and so you need to find out what the show is set up for for you before you go so you can understand see what they've done is got the, those pop-up posters for this environment, right? They're in a little aluminum stand and you pull it up because you can't really hang anything on this cloth, right? So uh, these are the things I'm trying to get people to pay attention to ahead of time. Let me, there was another one. Pris, I had a real quick question on um, the China um, booth looks really nice here. Now that wasn't cheap, right? No, no. <laughs> very expensive. But what we do is, uh, what we do at HTA, we have a budget, you know, t for these things, and then we uh, split some of the costs with all of the participants, you know. Instead of them, uh, let's say that if they went to this China show, if they could on their own, get a booth, maybe the booth is $3,000 just for them to get uh, space there. Then they have to do everything on their own. But when we have a Hawaii coordinated booth, then we take care of all of the graphics and everything, and we might charge them like $1,000 just to have their booth within the Hawaii Pavilion. My other question on this enormous booth like this, do you ship this back to Hawaii or does it stay in China? No, it stays there. That's uh, because the shows are every year and it's the shipping is so expensive, you know. Uh, so it's built there and it stays there. And uh, our uh, Chinese people our contractors in China, they're the ones that set it up for us. Generally, on a booth like that or something like that, how long do you expect to use it for? How many years will you allocate that? Uh, about five years. 
Mm -hmm. But sometimes, you know, they change portions of the booth, you know, or the pavilion. Mm -hmm. Does this China Expo, this one in particular, is it like 90% Chinese? Oh, attendee? definitely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this one here uh, doesn't only have uh, customers, but it also has the public, you know, that visits it as well. Huh? One of the things that you addressed um, and I think I'd like to drive the point home is, for example, you may be interested in the Korean market for whatever your product or service is, but you may find that there's a tremendous amount of Koreans that attend a certain trade show like this one in Japan, right? So don't just assume that you, you, could, you only focus on Korea. There may be other international trade shows where there's a large contingent of another country that comes to that trade show. So please pay attention to that too. And they usually tell you what percentage people come to a certain show. And that's how we make the decision on which shows I go to represent the countries, the international ones that are not you know, in their country. Like, that's how, that's why I'm going to IMAX uh, Frankfurt. HT Europe, Hawaii Tourism Europe, or Meet Hawaii Europe, they will handle all of the European clients, and I will handle all of the other clients and appointments that are non-European so that we don't have to send all of our contractors from all over the world to do that, because it doesn't uh, justify itself with the numbers there, you know. OK, any further questions? Yeah, Anthony. I believe uh, we, as Hawaii, we try to do very, very hard to promote the Hawaii. But at some time, as uh, the recent survey, about 38 percent of the, the, the visitor in China, their visa were denied. So, <laughs> what should we do? Yeah, that uh, that is a really big problem, and we're working on it, and we're working on it with um, our congressional delegation to help us with that. Uh, and uh, I actually attended a seminar in um, Shanghai in September where, uh, you know, because there was such a turnover in staff of uh, inspectors, visa inspectors, and they, don't, they didn't understand all about, uh, you know, we had this, um, New Skin China group. And New Skin China, it's a direct selling multi-level company. And they had 6,000 people qualify to come to this trip to Hawaii. And 2,000 of the top qualifiers did not make it here because their visas were rejected. And the reason their visas were rejected was because the inspectors didn't understand why these people from the provinces, provinces, how they could make so much money in such a short time to come on a trip like this, and they didn't understand uh, that these people were not employees of New Skin. They were independent contractors. And then the people also, they weren't well-traveled people, so they didn't know how to respond to a lot of the questions that were asked of them. So they just got rejected, and it was a really, <laughs> really tough situation. I just had a big site inspection for another 
major Chinese uh, com com company called Baby Care, which is another multi-level thing. And they were actually in Dubai two weeks ago, and they were going to make the announcement that Hawaii had been selected. And at the very last minute, they had to change their plans because Baby Care had 200 people who were going to um, their headquarters in Utah. And almost 70% of their um, visas were rejected. You know, so they said, until this whole thing settles between the United States and China or whatever, we cannot come to Hawaii because it's too much of a risk. You know, these people work all year to qualify for these trips and they can't get their visas for it. You know, so it's a challenge for us and we're trying to work through all of that, you know putting on seminars and workshops for these Chinese travel companies on what they need to do when to prepare these people for it, help the organizations, uh, help their people with the interview process, you know, so that they can answer the questions properly or understand it at least, you know, and work with the U.S. Embassy to prepare them that, you know, this group is coming to Hawaii and please, this is what it's all about and whatever, getting these letters to them. So it's a challenge, but we will overcome it. Okay? Any final questions for Chris? Okay, thank you very Didn't much. Didn't to take so much of your time. Yeah, no, wonderful, thank you. Great. Um, while I'm bringing up the next uh, presentation, let me remind you, there are, if there are some trade shows you're going to, I assume most of you are U.S. citizens, um, if you're going to trade shows, there are still some countries you need visas for. Um, they're generally easier to get. But being out here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, not every country has a consulate here or what have you. So if you're going to China, um, you need a visa. You usually do that through um, the Los Angeles office, the consulate there. Australia, you need a visa. But Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, those countries in Asia, at least, you, you don't need any visa. You can just show up there with a US passport Thailand, Malaysia is fine. India, you need a visa. Steve, can you think of any others you need visas for? Korea is no problem. Okay. Let me bring up our next. Yeah, Europe's easy. Um, our next presenter is um, Terry Funakoshi. She is the executive director at the Patsy Mink Center at the YWCA. She has a tremendous amount of experience with trade shows, um, particularly from her consulting work and past life in retail, a lot for Hilo Hattie and, and others. So she has a lot of practical experience of attending international trade shows. And um, I think she'll be a great presenter on this topic. So please, Terry, come up. And here's your karaoke mic. Oh, karaoke? OK. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Uh, just a little bit of my background. I've been going to trade so shows since uh, the 80s, so kind of a long time. I was in high school, actually, when I started. I've been to trade shows as a buyer, um, wholesale, manufacturer, and distributor. So a lot of different hats uh, for a lot of different reasons. But today, I just wanted to give you some tips before and after a trade show. Um, so we can go ahead and start. So before the show, uh, real basic planning. I can't stress the importance. 
to review your rules and regulations because one, your setup, your takedown has specific items. And if you don't follow the rules, you might not be asked back. So it's really important. Shipping, it's a really huge cost from Hawaii, so take a look at that. Uh, cash and carry, uh, some trade shows let you sell your product and others don't, so uh, you might sell it the last day. So be careful of what you do while you're transacting at the show. And a lot of times, I used to bring a lot of inventory and I used to make arrangements prior to sell it and then I would meet somebody after the show to sell it so I didn't have to you know, ship it back. It was really expensive. So trade show market research. Uh, depending where you're going, look at the culture. Everybody makes sales differently. And when you prepare your line sheets, make sure you know your cost in retail because your margin will vary. And when you research your, um, where you're going, look at the price points because you probably can increase your price points. So you want to make sure that your line sheets are specific to your trade show. Uh, shipping again, on your line sheets, make sure you include the shipping because it's going to be different for every show that you attend. Appointments, I would really target your clients ahead of time. If your competition is already in your area, let's say you're going to Japan, look at what, who their clients are and make sure you comp it and call ahead and try to schedule those appointments and try to schedule them on the slower times because you want to um, capture people in the busy times when they're walking through. Pre-promotion, so everybody knows about social media, your email blast, your mailers, depending where you're going. But one of the things I wanted to stress is a dedicated web page landing. So everybody's using social media, your phone, walking through the trade shows. So if you dedicate a page, a URL, a landing, uh, specifically targeting that trade show, it's easier for them to find. If they, they see your website, they don't have to navigate. So make it as easy as possible to be found. Before the show, booth message and design. So, you know, these are big companies here as examples, but the message here is be consistent on your branding. This is your one chance to stand out. So make sure you get that message across. Um, I like to say, like, if your booth is selfie ready, like you want to take your own picture in front of the booth, then you've succeeded. <laughs> okay. Uh, room for activities. A lot of times there's giveaway, sampling, sign up, contest. You got a lot of things going on. Make sure there's enough space and room because if it's too congested, they're just going to keep on walking. So really think of what your promotions are going to be. And then match your call to action. So again, your promotional message, what is that? If you have a trade show discount, et cetera, make sure it kind of reflects that in your branding. Okay. Team. Uh, team is important. So Chris was here earlier talking about the mice market. So for those of you who don't know, like if you're with the, I was with Hilo Hattie, like Rob said, and we had a specific person designated for the mice market. So we would attend those shows and would make sure we had an incentive for our groups to come to our store. So again, that's something that you folks might want to look at, um, either as a hui or individually. It's really important and a big percent of our business was driven from the mice market. It's meetings, conventions, uh, large groups. So let's see. So again, I kind of listed it. If you have enough people to break down and do these different things in your booth, that's wonderful. If not, make sure you um, cover these topics. And I have agent translator because if you go to Japan and you can't speak Japanese, uh, you're gonna have a problem. So I had a, I, when we went to the trade shows, we got an agent from Hawaii that spoke Japanese so that we knew what our message was ahead of time that we could translate it. Although there are translators there at the trade shows that you can hire and you probably meet that day, uh, you want to have a list of things that you want them to go over because it'll, it'll happen so quickly and then you don't want to miss any of that data. And another thing I will is company executive. Sometimes when you go uh, to foreign places, they want to know that who's in charge. And it's really good to have an executive, even if they don't talk, you say, oh, this is our you know, vice president, the owner, or somewhat, just pointing them out shows that you're serious in your business. Some of the goals, so find out why and set your goals. So, you know, for your own company, why are you going? What are you trying to achieve? So sales, of course, is one. New accounts, if you're new. If you want to close leads, if you're already established in that area and you want to close a big account, and let's say you only want to close one account because that's going to pay for your trip and make your money, then focus on that. So what does it look like for your company? 
So during the show, work the plan. So you know, you made a good plan, follow your schedule, make sure you run through your scripts. You know, the scripts doesn't have to be um, exact, but you know what you want to say, what the message is. Make sure you know how to ask people for sales. If you're not the salesperson, you have to, you have to do that job. That's important. Know your promotions. If you've decided that you're going to do an incentive during the promotion, make sure you know exactly what you're talking about, how to sign up, drive them to your website. Uh, make sure you're, you know all your product knowledge. That's really important. And again, translator, make sure you communicate with your translator everything you want them to know. If you can send it ahead of time, that would be great. But sometimes it's the day of meeting. So, and, they're used, and sometimes they're not salespeople. So you got to tell them how to make the sale, how to do the ask. Yeah. During the shows, five Ws, it's real simple, how to collect data. So if you just remember five Ws, client, you know, of course you're going to get their business card, but what type of store do they have? What are they interested in? How many stores? Where are they located? Delivery dates, you know, they have different seasons. Is your product a seasonal item? So make sure uh, what that is. And again, important, shipping and terms. Everybody's terms might be a little bit different. So definitely um, ask those questions. During the show promotion, so you know, a lot of people have giveaways. Um, like in Japan, there's 200, 300 people coming through, so you can't make that many giveaways. So be very specific on who you want to give that giveaway to, at least get their contact information. And if it is some type of swag, make sure it has your uh, company name or website or something that they can remember you by. Enter to win contests. Um, you know, if you come up with a contest, uh, make sure that you get all that data. So. Like I said, again, if you have a landing page that collects that data, now that everybody's so into their phone, you say, oh, go to my, you know, go to this um, URL or page, enter your information. You can win a prize. Maybe the prize is at the end of the day, end of the show, at, on, a, on the hour. But anyway, you want to get as many signups as you can and then reflect that in your booth. Trade show discounts, another popular one, incentive to order. You want them to make the order before they leave the show then you offer you know, maybe a percent off or something so you can collect that, uh, the purchase order. Photo opportunity, again, advertising. Make a hashtag for your event, and if the event has a hashtag, uh, continue to use that. And again, I wrote my selfie check. It's such an easy check. If you want to take your picture at somebody's booth, you know that booth is cool, and other people will too. Right? Social media, everybody knows social media, right? So again, just the five Ws, easy to remember. Uh, who post pictures of the client, you talking to the client in front of your booth. Make sure you can see your booth, the company products, the name, the pictures, when, where. Make sure you put the name of the trade show, the theme, the date, and again, why. Remind them why they need to come to your booth. Maybe you're doing free consultation, discounts, a contest, whatever. People want to, when they read your social media, they want to know why they should you know, come. See, after the show, so try to follow up within five days, at least five business working days. If you can make a personal call, that's great. So like I said, I had an agent who spoke Japanese when we went to the Japan show. So he called in Japanese, and that made the uh, Japanese customers feel like they can call Hawaii. There's somebody that can answer the phone that can speak to them. See, uh, Connect virtually. Again, if you had campaigns or promotions at the show, Remarket it. Send it out. Say, hey, you're at the show. We still want to offer you our 10% off or you know, whatever you were doing. So they, are, they feel like they already know you. So it's, you know, it's like a second touch. So measure your results. So you have to measure your results after the show. It's the hardest part. You've got to get your sales, your promotion, your social media. How did that go? And is this the right trade show for you? Maybe the trade show wasn't appropriate, but you need to, to look at that. And then document everything. So I just have your you know, good, bad, ugly. Goals, marketing, correspondence. You even have to document, did I actually follow up? Because if you don't follow up, then you know, what's the point? So again, document everything and then make your decisions. And how can I improve once you look at all the documentation? And that's it. That's my um, quick tips for the trade show. So thank you. So there'll be questions. Any questions for Terry?
Yeah, you, know, you need the karaoke. Repeat her question, please. Okay. Please. Could you give that presentation slide uh, to me? Oh, yes, I brought a few extra. You can see me after. Um, you know, for those websites, the landing pages, mm -hmm. is it important to have it in their local language, like Japanese, or have it in English? Yes, it's important wherever you go to make sure that it's user friendly. So if it's in Japan, you can have it translated in Japanese. So that's why a specific landing page for that specific trade show, whatever you're trying to you know, communicate. What, what's your experience with here getting people into your booth? Like what, what would you do in, in retail clothes? You were selling Aloha wear and whatever, but mm -hmm. you know what most of the people here are trying to sell. Like how do you get them, get in here, you know, reel them in? What's mm -hmm. your idea? Okay, well, you have to be cool and exciting. So of course I tried to bring the most fashionable people with me when I did uh, apparel. Uh, we, ahead of time, we called some radio stations and we said, if you come down, we'll give you some free apparel. We had shoes at one time, we give you some free cool boots. So again, we did a lot of pre-marketing to get them into the booth, you know, um, and we just tried to make it as cool as possible. Once I had a, a really, um, cute Hawaiian guy doing lomi lomi massage, so, you know, whatever you can kind of think of that relates to your product uh, and make it, you know, stand out. You, well, also I would say most of the companies that attend today and a lot of Hawaii companies, they can't afford a $25,000 booth set up like this. So. What, what's your experience with a, for a small company? Right, so for small companies, you can still do that. So when we first started, it was really expensive to have a lot of you know samples to bring over. So we just did printouts, like how they did it, but in a smaller scale. Because if you're in a 10 by 10 booth, you can do a couple of you know printouts, and it's not and it's light. So if freight was easy, we could hand carry that. And then when you go to the trade show. Uh, you can order uh, tea stands or four ways or shelving, and then we would put the put the product there. But the main thing was our banners because it was bright, it was colorful, and it called out to our brand. And it was inexpensive because there was no freight. Yeah. If you recall from Pris's presentation, I was pointing out the pop-up stands. Mm -hmm. Did you do you use those? Uh, we do. Uh, we did use that. It's kind of like today, the step and repeat. You know, when you go someone and where and they have all the logos and you take your picture in front of that. Same thing. So you just have to be creative. And those aren't too expensive, and they're very light. And you can take you can take that with you. I just see that that's a trend and things that I use in my own trade show booths. Here's one right here because you, um, you can get a few years worth out of these things for a couple hundred bucks and um, they're strong and you can actually change the banner later if you wanted to but it allows you to travel to different kind of trade shows that might have hard walls or soft walls and it's hard to hang posters and what have you i just recommend we um, do that there's a few local suppliers here too um, that make these yeah, and, and those are usually under $200, so it's not too bad in the pricing, and it's light. So another thing I want to just leave you with is if you um, are a retailer, wholesaler in Hawaii, what I say is we are in the travel retail business. Travel meaning that we, do, we sell a lot in Hawaii to tourists, and even when we go outside, we represent Hawaii. And that's why, like Chris's presentation, the meetings, incentives, all those types of people, that's our customer too. So if you're not looking into that market, you uh, really should. Can you just quantify your um, return on participation in that mice market? Like, um, you know, what percent of revenue that generated for you guys? So again, I think uh, the question was on the mice market, how much revenue did we get or how much more revenue can you get for your company? Again, it depends. Like if you are an amenity company or you have chips or anything like that, that in quantity that a group would want, it can be big business. Because if a group comes in a 200 uh, people group from Japan um, on a meeting, you know, they need a goodie bag. So who's going to be in that goodie bag? 
So right mm -hmm. now, you're leaving it up to all those marketing people to fill that goodie bag. But if you were there with some peers representing Hawaii's goodies, they might choose you. So again, it's really up to you. And like when I did it, a big chunk of my business, more than 25%, was from meetings and incentives. We had to make sure that we diversified to get that market. That's big. Yeah. What um, When you go to a trade show and you have all, let me see if I can bring up all of these people that you were talking about, the people who are in your team, are you wearing uniforms too? Uh, well, I did a uniform division too at one time, so it's important to all wear what you're selling. So when we were doing apparel, we wore our apparel. Uh, and when we did, uh, we were a distributor for shoes and boots, we wore our boots. You know, so you have to you have to be proud of your your product. I think even in a very conservative place like Japan, we're fortunate coming from Hawaii that we can clearly wear aloha wear at the booth, right? You don't, I don't recommend you have a black suit on, um, that sort of thing. Uh, we're, I think we're quite lucky in that regard. Wouldn't you agree that you should, no matter what your product is, you should still go with nice aloha wear? Yeah, and especially if you go with a group and you have a Hawaii pavilion, you are representing Hawaii. So you have to make sure that you have that aloha spirit, first of all. And that's what we tell our translator. So they always start with aloha. Like Chris said in 2011 when we had APAC, and that's when I learned about Auntie Pilahi Paki, who um, speaks about the Hawaiian, um, the aloha spirit. Mm -hmm. That's actually a state law. So you can look, you can Google it, and it tells you all about the aloha spirit and what we need to have when we travel outside and even on the islands. Wow. Okay, any more questions for Terry? She'll be on the panel later too, but are there any questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go through my own presentation real quickly, but I think you'll see uh, in the first slide or two, my presentation is very similar to what Terry just talked about. So while I'm doing that. Can I get everybody on the panel to come up and I'll, I'll go through this quickly and then we'll just have the panel right after that. We have quite a, a several very experienced people on the panel. Do we have enough seats? Maybe can you swing up a chair on the side? Hi. Hi. How are you? Oh, I'm Neil. Oh, I know, yeah, I didn't, I know. but I didn't see you um, slip in here. I had to finish my Japan tours this morning. Oh, okay. I'm just coming on. Just hop in anywhere. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to go through my slides and um, from an HPEC standpoint in my own personal job. Uh, a couple of quick things I would point out. Um, if you're starting to do things internationally, you should look at this in general, but when you're talking with your agent and the show people and the organizers, start to adopt some of these international formats. So for example, on the date, today is what, May 10th, we would say 5-10. But in much of the rest of the world, including Japan, they could say 10-5. And so you start thinking about October 5th, or is it May 10th, and everybody gets all screwed up. So it's better to just use a format like that because nobody can make a mistake on that, okay? Um, even it, start using it in the U.S., for example. Nobody will make a mistake. Um, if you've been to any of my marketing presentations before, you've heard me um, uh, evangelize about getting onto A4 paper in that um, if you're going to Japan or pretty much anywhere outside of the United States, this normal eight and a half by 11 inch letter size paper is not what the rest of the world uses. They use A4. So don't spend thousands of dollars printing your literature for your trade show booth here and then taking it over there. Because what happens is you pass it out at a trade show in Japan or Korea or somewhere, and this letter size paper does not fit in their folders. So they look at that and they say, okay, that's great. And when you're not looking, they just throw it away. 
Okay, so you spent a lot of money uh, to just throw it away. Then also, the other thing about being outside of the United States, you quickly learn is that nobody, so let's say in Japan, has a very good idea about miles or pounds. Pounds is very confusing to people. So just start figuring out how to get on the metric system. There's no other way to go about it. You'll save yourself a lot of trouble. Um, plan ahead for the booth. Find out what you need in terms of lights. Um, at every trade show I've ever been to anywhere in the world, uh, lighting and electricity is expensive. It's usually a different union that's in charge of installing that at the booth, and so that can get very expensive. Do you need internet uh, or Wi-Fi or whatever you're trying to do? Do you need a computer like this at your booth so you can display a presentation or something? Try to find that out. That could be a different union that's in charge of the internet. Um, usually tables, the literature rack, as I said, this eight and a half by 11 inch paper might not fit in some of the literature racks outside of the US, so think about that. Um, do you need chairs to sit down in? Um, I don't recommend that you sit, but if you're having a meeting with somebody, a booth visitor, then do you need chairs for them to sit down? Do you need a display, a computer display? Make sure if your display is there that you understand that it's what the inputs are, if it's HDMI, and so for example, this computer is only HDMI. If I went there and it was the old VGA plug, okay, I can't use it, right? So try to understand all of that ahead of time. Carpet, carpet is always an issue at these trade shows. They're, it's usually included in the price, but not always. Um, San Francisco, if you ever go to a trade show in San Francisco, <laughs> it's a different, uh, uh, union in charge of the carpet than everything else, so that's a different fee. Um, you need a meeting table, and then of course, what is your signage and all that outside? And do you do you have a foreign name for your organization? Do you want the foreign name, like in Japanese, on your sign? Let the organizers know that quickly. Um, this is something I found throughout my career. You can always get bogged down on this topic. This is a pretty standard, straight up three meter or three points, depending on where you are. We tend to use 10 feet, but in Japan, they're usually three meters. Some places will be 3.3 .3 meters, but generally you get these hard walls and they're easy to put together. It gets your standard gray carpet. But what happens is people buy posters. These are rails that stick out and these walls slide into the rails. And um, people buy posters and they try to tape them across here, and there's always this big bump in the middle because of this rail. So try to figure out from the show organizer what are the dimensions of this area, and try to get your posters to fit inside there so they don't have to cross these rails. I just found that it always looks really, really ugly. And I, I'm, I'm guilty of doing it incorrectly. Um, some countries, Korea, for example, you could be on 220 volts and your plugs could be really different. Um, in China or Korea, Korea uses the European plug, which I, I've never understood how that happened, um, but that's the way it is. So uh, understand that ahead of time going in and make sure you have the adapters for all the electricity you need. Um, as I say here, Unions are a big deal in the trade show world, and it's different in every country. Um, again, San Francisco is really union heavy if you go there for a trade show, and there's all kinds of things you can take into Moscone uh, that they won't let you hand carry in there. You have to have a union representative carry in, and it raises my blood pressure just talking about it. <laughs> um, some things, I always have a little case with me that of just be prepared, the old Boy Scout model of always be prepared and have some of these things with you because you never know when you're going to need them. Um, strong double-sided tape is a big thing. Having some good scissors or wire hooks or just ways that you might need to jerry-rig your booth somehow in, a, in an emergency, right? It's, things always pop up. Um, I find that um, ladies I've worked with that are in the know on trade shows, they have band-aids for their shoes because they always seem to get blisters on the back of their heels and so they always bring um, some good band-aids for that. Um, I like to carry a good lanyard 
in my briefcase for a trade show so that when I'm at a trade show, I can have my own or my company lanyard because usually the ones they give you are just a little piece of string and it looks like you don't attend very many trade shows if that's what you're using. So you just, by, by having just that little piece of string around your neck, you're showing people that you don't do this very often. So it's better to have your own kind of lanyard. You can get your corporate logo on them really cheap. Um, before the show, um, Terry covered all of this for the most part, but I would say um, try to get, if you can, it's pretty easy in the modern world to print things locally in the country that you're going to, and you should try to print it there instead of pr printing thousands of pages of stuff here and carrying it over there. That's one quick lesson. How much can you carry on the plane? If I fly Delta, I get three suitcases. If I fly United, they just basically slap me. Um, <laughs> so it just depends on what your trying, you know, what your airline is. But know what you can carry and what you have to ship. That's a, a lot of room for error there, and it's very costly um, to ship product that you were planning on carrying. That can ruin your whole uh, budget. Advanced marketing. I think Terry did a really good job of talking about this, but. Um, Get the information out there a month, two months, three months ahead of time. Um, invite the clients, potential customers to come. Don't forget to tell them what your booth number is. Don't just say, I'm going to be at the show. There's a thousand people at the show at least, right? Tell them where your booth is. Um, social media posts in English and in the target market language, preferably just the target market language. But it's nice to tell the rest of the world who might read English that you're going to that um, event. During the show, okay, we're all sitting, but I would say try not to sit. Um, have multiple people at the booth so you can stagger going to lunch or going to the restroom or going for a snack. Um, look, look, smile, you're doing sales work. You know, A lot of times I see people in the booth, it looks like they're there at gunpoint or something in a hostage situation. They're just, it, they're, it's torture for them to be there. But then you shouldn't be there. I mean, your sales, your marketing, you should be smiling and happy and, you know, um, wear some nice clothes, get your business cards ready, um, you know, get a case like or something, keep it in your pocket or your purse or something that you can get cards out really quickly and don't do this crazy thing a lot of people from the US they keep a business cards in their wallet and then when they pull it out and they give it to a really nice conservative Japanese guy there's got this big arc in the card from their butt print basically it's really <laughs> ridiculous I just feel so embarrassed when I see people do that you know and then you know learn how to give the cards out locally and properly um, it's very straightforward if you can do that. Um, mints, you know, a lot of people need mints. You might be one of them, even though you don't think so. Uh, when you're having conversations with people up close, it's nice not to destroy the relationship with your halitosis or whatever. But I, I find that when you're at a booth all day, um, yeah, you know, you should have some kind of mint thing going. And don't chew gum, that's, that's just, verboten. Um, I see this a lot, okay? Uh, trade shows, increasingly, if you'll see when you go to a trade show now, everybody has this, right? And so when there's a little downtime, people tend to start doing this, and then, oh, that's an interesting email, and I might as well check the weather, and what's going on, and all of a sudden, you, you've been looking down for 20 minutes, you're, and you're so unapproachable as people walk by, right? So just keep an eye on that kind of thing. Try not to use your phone that much if you can. And then you'll see towards the end of the day, people coming, especially a big international trade show, lots of people coming from other parts of the world. They're jet lagged or could be hung over from going out last night or whatever the reason is towards the end of the day, you can see he obviously, um, you know, is tired. But who's going to visit that booth, and what does that say about the company, right? It's really common. And this thing on the left, I just see that so much. People playing on their phones and um, customers passing by. Just keep an eye on that. 
while you're at the show, check your competitors, walk around, do things besides just stand at your own booth, right? Use that opportunity to, to see what other people are doing and figure out what are competitors doing and uh, how, is the, how are the competitors set up for after sales service? Who are their agents? Um, and then meet the people around you, you know, just talk to the other booths around you. If you're there by yourself, maybe you, you want to meet um, the people at the ne the guy at the next booth or the lady at the next booth so you can watch each other's booth while they run to the restroom. Um, and then ask them, you know, what shipping company did you use to get your stuff here? How was that? Um, it's different from what I used. Uh, you, you know, you can use your neighbors for um, a lot of things. Finding out um, what other trade shows they might go to. You know, it might not be exactly a complimentary um, product to yours, but you're still in the same world if you're at that trade show. So f just try to find out as much as you can from other people. Also your samples, because you're bringing your samples from far away and you've had to carry them or ship them and it was expensive. So your samples and things are a precious commodity. So try to keep your samples reserved for very key customers, right? It's a tricky thing because you can run out of your samples on the first day or you reserve them and hold them back so much that you have too many left over at the end and then you have to carry them back. So just try to gauge that and figure out um, you know, who really are your, your key, uh, key customers and who you can give samples for. This is something I always like to do, or I learn to do, is find the managing company of the trade show and introduce yourself to those people. Right? Even if you're going to the Hawaii Pavilion, there's still a company that actually manages that trade show in Japan or China or whatever. And go find those people and introduce yourself, bring them a little Aloha Mac thing or something from Hawaii, get to know them. And when you do that, you find that the next year you'll get the booths you want, or if you need a table, you can get it really quickly. Stuff like that I think is really, really important. It's very good to maintain a relationship with the show managers. Um, the other thing that can be really important is you need to print something. So find out where is the nearest printer and those people, I mean, physically, a printer, like a Epson Hewlett Packard thing, where is that printer if you need it? And if you're nice to the show people, um, they usually let you print some things for free. But if you have to go to 7-Eleven or something and use their printer, it's like 10 bucks a page or some ridiculous thing, right? So just try to understand that. Um, learn what is the attendance at the show and get all of that data. Um, in the modern world, they won't give you the um, database. Some years ago, if you were really nice to them, they might give you the database of contact, but nobody will do that anymore. So, um, but they will tell you, okay, 10% came from Korea and 12% came from Germany or what have you. And at least it's good to, it's really good for you, for your marketing to have that data. And then most of the shows, especially the big ones, you can pick your, um, booth for next year before you leave the current show. So work on that. And it's, if you get to know the show management staff, that becomes a much um, easier task, right? Because some of you might have products where you want to be on a corner booth or on an end, or you want to tell them, no, I don't want to be next to my competitor or anywhere near my competitor, so I want to be over there. And the more you understand, um, the trade show management people and they understand you, the easier it is to get the booth space that you want. Okay? Um, that After the show, real quickly, Terry covered a lot of this. Um, I try, as I said, everybody has a phone on them. Now that means you actually have a scanner and there's some really good apps to allow you to scan in business cards as you get them. And then that night at the hotel, you can send messages or ask your agent or whomever um, send messages to customers. I think Terry, you said five days within five days. Yeah, I try to I try to do it as quickly as possible just while the iron is hot. Um, another thing, if you've been to any of my marketing presentations, I talk a lot about getting maintaining a database, setting it up, and if you're attending foreign trade shows, especially Korea. Um, um, well, Korea is important, but Japan, China, you know, get to learn how to figure out 
what is the Japanese given name and the family name and you know, include that in your database because later if you're sharing that information or trying to send an email to that person, it's much better to use their, the name as they would like it uh, written. Um, social media, try to find these customers and then follow them on social media to show them that you are interested in their um, products. Mm, that's it for me. Um, any quick questions for me before we jump into the panel? Anyone? Good, as I said, um, Terry's presentation was really good. It covered everything. Marlene, do you want me to bring this one up, your presentation here? Also, you can see here, this is what the TIGS booth, the pavilion, Hawaii pavilion looks like, but you can see these rails I was talking about, how it's hard to get posters to, to run across there. It's sort of very universal. Who's that guy? He looks <laughs> cute. Uh, let's see. Here's a good use. Of, see these pop-up stands, how they have three different colors. It could be three different product lines on those pop-up stands. Everybody know what I'm talking about with those? I should have brought one up from my office now, I realize. I think they're just very versatile. So you need to check, you know, make sure <clears throat> tablecloths are important, right? They're not included in the price of your booth or whatever. So make sure you have the tablecloths that you need to the color and whatever to match the, uh, the booth in general. Those are pens? Mm -hmm. Nice. Some products much more, lend themselves much more nicely to having a black tablecloth, jewelry and things like that. Do you have any comment about this one? Right. Um, so I think a lot of you um, have an idea of what the Tokyo International Gift Show um, is all about. And Terry had a lot of photos from that show. Um, I'm Marlene Hiraoka with the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. And we have been organizing a Hawaii Pavilion at the gift show for the past, this is our eighth year. So um, what we do is, as Jamie mentioned, we um, build out a Hawaii pavilion and we pro provide opportunities for Hawaii companies to um, purchase either a half booth or a full booth. And um, we work very closely with Neil Arakaki. He's uh, the president of Jack C Corporation and uh, is our coordinator for this show. This year, we, we're adding another component, which is uh, exporting study tour. And this will be held uh, during the same week as the gift show. So um, I, if you are interested in this, um, please see me later. And just the last one. Um, this one? Yeah. And as Jamie mentioned, please check our website often, invest.hawaii.gov. Um, we constantly update uh, the information, um, activities, opportunities that we're working on, and we'd love to have you all participate. Great, thank you. Is that you in the blue or the green? <laughs> okay, um, now let's make sure we have the panel, everybody understands who's on the panel. Terry, remember Terry down at the end from uh, Patsy Ming Center. Then Jimmy Chan from the Hawaii Chip Company. He's also uh, a board member of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council with me. Aaron Uehar is the owner of Chocolea. Did you bring samples? <laughs> That's what everybody wants. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, Hideki Yamane is with the Hawaii State uh, Ag Department. So if you have agricultural product specific questions, um, and he knows obviously a lot about uh, selling in Japan. Marlene introduced Neil, but we'll do that again from Jaxi Corporation, Menahuni Mac, and I'm Rob, Marlene from DBET, and then Steve Craven is a HPEC board member, 
Uh, but he comes at this from a lot of uh, U.S. government experience and having been at uh, lots and lots of trade shows from that angle. So we put together this panel for you guys to answer or ask questions to, and we will just open it up for a free flow of um, information exchange. And I have a bunch of questions I'll ask to if anybody needs a Kickstarter. So questions, please, for our panel. Trade show, what to do before, what to do after, what to do during. I had asked um, Jimmy and Aaron to be here because I know that they've both been through various high step programs. And in particular, what I had wanted them to be able to convey to you is what did they expect the trade, an international trade show to be like before they went there the first time? And then what was it actually like? And were there any lessons learned from their experiences in that? So can I pass the microphone to you guys and let us know? Um, yeah, so, so we make... Um, Taro chips and sweet potato chips, they're um, in this bag here, and then, uh, thank you. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, we also have a uh, hot sauce, the Kilauea Fire hot sauce. Um, you know, I, I actually saw a nice picture of that, uh, that booth, um, so I have to note that that's a good display. Um, and, um, yeah, my expectation was, um, you know, I, I went up uh, to Japan. My first trip to Japan was actually with, with Neil, and I think he's leading that um, export opportunity um, tour. Highly recommend it because it really opened my eyes to the potential. I mean, you know, you get to Tokyo, and it's 10, 10 million people. You know, Hawaii, we barely scratch 1 million. Um, so there's this huge potential. But he also pointed out, hey, is your product ready? And of course, you take pride in your products, you work hard every day, and you think, oh yeah, you know, we'll attend the trade show and we'd be filling up eight containers full, you know, um, and sending them over. Um, uh, it's, you know, eight years later and uh, not, not, not quite filling up even a container yet. But we are having success, um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're slowly building our business. Um, we've hit pitfalls, um, but the area that really surprised me was how much I learned by participating in these shows and getting feedback on my products and how much that actually grew my business in Hawaii. So even though my export business has been kind of creeping along here, um, the business in Hawaii, you know, as a result of what I've learned in participation overseas, getting feedback has actually increased, you know, steady 20% every year. So, um, and with that, we're even having trouble keeping up as is. But that, that shows me opportunity that we still have in Hawaii, um, but just finding a way to reach, reach, um, reach people in other markets. And that's why I'm actually really interested in, in the opportunities with some of these um, mice uh, um, expos and whatnot. But yeah, that's kind of my, my experience. Um, mine's is similar to actually Jimmy's. Uh, we have a chocolate company. We make everything fresh in Manoa, and we started a retail shop in 2014. So we're also fairly new. We kind of stay up there. We make the chocolate. We sell the chocolate. And I'm kind of running day to day, just doing what needs to be done. Uh, my first trip outside of Manoa, <laughs> even to do Made in Hawaii, was the only thing that we had participated in up to that point, uh, was the Tokyo International Gift Show, which became available for us as an opportunity because of High Step to open doors for us to see that maybe we could try and take a chance to do something different. And um, also went up with Neil and Jaxi Corporation, and they did it so seamlessly for someone like us who never participated in a, in a trade show to just say, I'm a Hawaii person, what does the Hawaii people do? Um, can you help us get a booth? You know, and, and they'll provide everything, like the fixtures and what you need. But I learned beyond that, there's so much you have to do on your own too, because they said there's shelving, there's this, but not going into any trade show before, I was like, what does that mean? What does the shelf look like? Is it silver? Is it brown? Is it, how big is it? And looking at their website, at the pictures, and the key for me was actually to talk to other Hawaii companies, is how I got a lot of information. So I was actually gonna talk about him a lot today, but he's here. <laughs> Neil was just, is just asking other people in the same industry as me, or even outside, 
uh, what do these shelves look like? Is it okay? Um, do I have to bring up like a tablecloth? Because I didn't listen to a presentation uh, prior and took notes from like what you heard today from Terry and from Rob, which I'm still writing notes here because I'm like, oh gosh, I wish I knew that before. Um, but then getting up there and then even after I set up and had researched and prepared, was walking around and talking to all the other Hawaii people. That's how I met Jimmy even though we all live here, we never actually talk and meet until we were in Japan, um, and seeing their booth and going, oh, I don't have one of those pop-up things, or asking others to come and look, and they said, your, your display is too flat. You know, this is too, there's no, not enough color. Your packaging is not enough Hawaii. You're from Hawaii, you need to scream Hawaii. That's what Rob told me a lot. So actually just going tr grew my business tremendously because I thought it was, you know, doing a good job and just staying in the day-to-day, but seeing Japan was like, or even any other place outside of Manoa or Oahu, was like, wow, there's actually a lot of potential, and now I'm setting more long-term, bigger goals, as opposed to my short-term, you know, one-year goal or two-year goal, is now looking at what we could do in 10 years or 20 years, um, but I might not have seen that if I didn't just get off the rock, you know, so. So could, you're holding the microphone, so let me just ask you one more question. Has Going to international events and marketing to even tourists that are coming here, has that made your Hawaii-based business, how has that changed your local business? Um, well, like, like you folks were mentioning, this we're in tourism, right? Everybody comes here, so a third of our customers are actually from Japan. Um, but that connection actually just built, it, it did increase our business because I think it made us more aware of the culture and the, um, the country and an appreciation for the Japanese who are supporting us, that it built this relationship for us to say, hey, we've been there, we saw a little bit of your country, we saw what you're doing, and we came back and even changed some of our packaging based on what we saw there. You know, um, like We got feedback on the taste of the product, but then a lot of our feedback was on our packaging. Um, and just changing that, we've already seen a difference. And they really like that we invested in at least coming out there and showing interest in their country because they're also showing interest in Hawaii and coming here. So it's kind of just a, um, like a give and take, right? Like we're coming here to say hi, and then please come to Hawaii and say hi to us too. So definitely increase our any, business. Do you have any examples here of your packaging that you've... Sure. Where, where would click I click? Click on our products at the top. And then go ahead into, um, we had shop online. So this is just some of our packaging, our products here. But uh, one of the things that Japanese had told us was our boxes weren't 90 degree angles. Um, our previous ones weren't um, clean enough. But mainly that it didn't scream Hawaii enough because they really wanted to get a product from Hawaii. Everything that we do is made in Hawaii. We use local ingredients. But yet our packaging was beautiful but just not... Hawaii and they also wanted the story behind the packaging so we redesigned things so that like this palm leaf is our island inspired design so there's a whole story behind it so now we can talk about our packaging in depth for like media and then also just we worked with a local designer and we wanted to showcase a little bit more of who we are but stay true to our brand but also tie in more of that Hawaii so uh, that's been really successful for us. Great, 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 great. Thank you. Can I just add something about the packaging too? Um, you know, um, you kind of you kind of realize like um, you know the, it, and this is Japan specific. You know, with um, how high end their packaging is. Well, you know, it's one thing to invest that in chocolates, and you can kind of hide the price point with chips. It's really tough. Um, and uh, so what, what we what we've been doing is we kind of shifted our model, saying you know we gave up on the packaging side. We said that that's what you're gonna get, you know, if we're gonna make it here. Um, but we concentrated on um, the food service market becoming a component of menu items in a restaurant is a lot easier for us to compete than trying to go head to head with other chips on the shelf at retail value. So, um, and that's, that's where we've been actually having success in um, terms of our export sales. A lot of it's, you know, chips in bulk packaging and then also sauce in um, bulk containers for restaurants. Great. Um, Hideki-san, while you have the microphone, can I ask you, um, can you tell the audience about agricultural specific trade shows that might be of interest for them? 
Okay, uh, so hi everybody. My name is Hideki Yamane. I'm from uh, Market Development Branch at State Department of Agri Agriculture. So um, for international trade shows, uh, we have uh, two kinds. One is the state-funded programs, and second is um, USDA-funded programs. So uh, for trade shows overseas, uh, we go to um, uh, Top priority at the moment is Japan market uh, because it's uh, number one export destination for um, agricultural products uh, from Hawaii. Um, and then, but we also work with the um, other markets such as uh, Singapore, uh, uh, Asian market, China, Hong Kong, uh, Canada, Australia, and uh, Middle Middle East. Um, I I found I went to the Dubai. Uh, in February, um, in uh, there is a golf food trade show. It's the world biggest food re uh, food and ag related trade show, and then I I'm so surprised to hear there is huge demand for Hawaii products from Dubai. Um, they pay um, no limit uh, for the products. So I think Hawaii products tends to be higher. Um, the cost is higher. So I think it's a good fit um, to export after Japan. Um, and then um, they're particularly looking for chocolate uh, from Hawaii, and um, macadamia nuts, coffee, and dried fruits. So um, for state uh, events, trade shows, uh, sometimes we uh, charge you a small amount of participation fee. Uh, but uh, we provide you with the booth uh, for free. And then uh, for other trade shows like Hong Kong or China, we work with the federal governments, but uh, you get the, a booth space for a discounted uh, fee, discounted price. Um, so normally for Dubai show is uh, one booth, uh, three meter by three meter is uh, about 7,000 US dollars very expensive because it's the uh, longest trade shows ever, uh, in the world. Uh, so usually uh, FoodEx is uh, for four days? Four days. Four days. And, but this Dubai show is for five days. So it's longer to capture more um, buyers. So that's why the price is higher. But the buyers coming not only from Middle East, but they come from all over the world. Uh, for example, uh, France, uh, England, uh, all of the Europe and also from Asia as well. So that's uh, trade show is a good market, a good uh, event to, uh, to promote Hawaii products. If you are interested in uh, participating in uh, such trade shows, please contact me and um, we can um, uh, walk you through uh, the process uh, to participate in those shows. Did I answer your questions? Um, well, <laughs> I, yeah, that was great. But I was also curious about FoodEx because I know a lot of Hawaii companies like to go to FoodEx. And there's the other one, the Food Ingredients Show. I forget the acronym. Uh, I oh, yes. Uh, I fear. Yeah. International Food Ingredients and Additives Fair. Actually, I'm leaving tomorrow to Tokyo to uh, attend that event next week. Uh, that is usually in May, and that uh, event is uh, purely targeting B2B market, uh, especially uh, ingredients market, in ingredients and additives. So for example, um, uh, like a s hot sauce uh, could be a good uh, product to promote. And next week, uh, we have five companies coming from, I I'll be taking five companies from Hawaii. One is called uh, Cyanotech. Uh, they are making spirulina, um, you know, like a supplement uh, that is sold in Costco and everywhere. Um, that company is trying to penetrate in the Japanese market with a supplement, a bulk supply of the spirulina. Uh, and also uh, Hamakua nut. Uh, they're trying to sell their like off-grade uh, macadamia nuts products, you know, uh, like a uh, different sizes or you know kind of a waste from the processing like a you know macadamia nut powder there is a way to sell that uh, product to the Japanese market which is the ingredient market and also um, we have a big island processing company they have uh, noni powder 
so this noni powder is highly demanded in Japanese market, uh, especially with the aging population in Japan. They are looking for healthy and you know nutraceutical products. So um, we are bringing those products. And then companies, uh, for example, they, um, like a Meiji confectionery or Lotte. Uh, Morinaga, that kind of companies are trying to find a unique and innovative products from Hawaii. Uh, and that must be also health, um, you know, uh, nutraceutical products. So um, we are trying to uh, capture that, that kind of a market. So uh, we are targeting I, um, this uh, ingredient market. Uh, some, as uh, Jimmy and um, uh, Aaron mentioned the packaging is uh, very important uh, in Japanese market. Uh, sometimes it's probably better that Japanese company make that package in Japan for you. So uh, if, you, if you can just send the ingredients and Japanese company to make products out of it and they package uh, in a Japanese way and that might be easier to uh, sometimes it's probably easier to sell your products, and you can also brand your products. You know, for example, this is um, the uh, chocolate powder. Powder is you know made by, for example, a chocolate, and that ingredient in, in, is included in this kind of a, you know Japanese smoothie or something. So that would sell uh, easily in Japanese market, and the Japanese uh, market is very strict on f uh, import regulations. Uh, there's two laws uh, regulating the uh, food m products to be imported. One is a food sanitation law, and the other is a um, uh, plant quarantine ins inspection law. So it's pretty hard to you know, uh, go through the, um, all the hurdles, but you know, ingredients uh, sometimes is easier to get in. So that's it. That's Great. My comment. Excellent. Any, any specific question about agricultural products? Please. For the Japanese market, uh, beef jerky, is that something that is like you stay away from? Away from yeah, yeah, because of the you know mad cow disease uh, happened from the USA uh, 2011. Oh, no, I'm sorry, uh, 2004. Uh, Japan government still regulate uh, import of beef jerky, but uh, they can import turkey jerky. Um, and, and pork jerky as well. Actually, have you heard of the turkey jerky? Uh, <laughs> that's a turkey jerky from uh, mainland. They're doing very well in Japanese market. Uh, but beef jerky, unfortunately, is still not allowed to be imported to the Japanese market. Any qu more question about agriculture or anything? I I'd then I'd like to talk a little bit about costs. And do you have a question? Um, what about things like fresh coconut water? How easy is that to get in those kind of market? Coconut water? Um, yeah, I think uh, there is no restriction for coconut water. Uh, if you, so you basically have to provide your importers with uh, production flow chart. And ingredients list. I think ingredients is just coconut, right? Coconut water or something. <laughs> so it's no additives or anything like that, right? Yes. So uh, you can just uh, submit that you know document to the Japanese importer, and then Japanese uh, importer to submit to the uh, authority in Japan, and it should be fine. Can I contact you? Sure, sure. Yes, um, I'll uh, gi uh, give you my card later. Great. Um, uh, before I get to costs, I should get Neil and um, Steve to chime in here and say, did uh, your vast experience at trade shows, did our presentations earlier, did we miss anything or anything you'd like to add about that? The trade show experience is so huge, you always miss plenty of things. Um, just. By way of introduction, I'm, I'm Steve Craven. I'm a former commercial officer at American embassies overseas. And among other things, I managed the American pavilions at some of the world's largest trade shows, both in Europe and in Asia. And that brings up one of the things 
that is going to shock you if you have never been to one of these huge international trade shows. Uh, believe me, anything at the Blaisdell, this is Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. Um, most trade shows on the U.S. Main, mainland, a little better than Mickey Mouse, yeah. But you want big? You go to a place in Germany called Hanover. Hanover's only industry is trade shows. Hanover in the early 1990s, and they have more now, had 25 exhibit halls, each of which, each of which was larger than the New York Coliseum. You're talking a whole difference in scale to almost anything, you know, if you haven't been to one of these big shows internationally. So that is going to be a shock. Be prepared for it. Another one we got close to, uh, Rob was talking about taking Band-Aids. <laughs> Spend a fair amount of money on the best shoes you can possibly buy. Uh, folks on the panel were talking about four and five day trade shows as being long ones. I had to laugh at that. <laughs> Uh, I managed the huge, the American pavilions at uh, the world's largest trade show, CBIT, in the early 1990s in Hanover. And uh, CBIT lasted nine days at that point. And the first day, uh, yeah, you, your feet would hurt. The second day, your legs would start to hurt. <laughs> Long about the fourth day, you're just numb. <laughs> so, uh, I, 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 I vote for uh, Echo shoes. They worked for me, but there are a number of them. Do not be afraid to spend money on shoes. Take two or three pairs. Make sure they're broken in before you ever get to the show. Um, this may be worth your life. <laughs> uh, another thing which has been hinted at, well, more than hinted at by Rob, is get out of your stand, leave the booth. Uh, whether that means taking more people to the show, or just getting to know your neighbors, or taking part in an American or a state pavilion, and maybe some of the you know, the people working the working the pavilion can watch you stand while you leave. It is vitally important to get away from the stand. And the reason being is for many of you, the primary reason you're at the show is not to sell. And that's cream on the top. What you're really doing is market research. Before the show ever begins, you want to study the show catalog. Take a look at who else is exhibiting. Some of those are going to be your competitors. Some of those are potential customers. Make sure you go and see all of them. Now, with your competitors, you don't have to say a word. Just watch and observe. <laughs> see what their marketing points are. You know, see how people are reacting to what it is, whatever it is they're selling and see if you can steal some good ideas from them. Uh, you may also spot some other things. One year at CBIT in Hanover, uh, we had a U.S. software company who was doing that, and they noticed in the Taiwan pavilion next door that there was a nice Taiwanese company that was selling a knockoff version of their own software. <laughs> And uh, they came to me about it as, as the U.S. Pavilion Manager, and uh, I set up a meeting with the Taiwan Pavilion Manager and the Taiwan Company. I had some official-looking Germans come along with me, and um, we threatened to have the Taiwan Company kicked out of the show. Well, the conversation began, and before the end of the nine days, the U.S. software company had hired the Taiwan company to represent them in most of East Asia, 
because they were doing such a damn good job selling that pirated software. <laughs> so take advantage of these things. And I, I could go on all day, Rob, so. <laughs> that was good. All right, thank you. All right, I'm going to pass it to Neil for a second. And then I, I'd like to focus on everybody, but I, I think the companies need to understand what are the costs involved in going to an international trade show. You can get into a pavilion, such as TIGS, and it's quasi-subsidized so that a, a small company doesn't pay that much. But if you weren't in a Hawaii pavilion and you were going to a trade show like at Hanover or somewhere, what do you think are the costs involved for a small company? What do they need to think about and budget for? Hmm. Well, my forte is Japanese trade shows, but I've done shows in Beijing and all over the place. Uh, when you're not doing a government subsidized uh, type of uh, presentation or pavilion, you're on your own, you're signing up your booths directly from the show organizers or, or our semi, um, and they can get very pricey. Um, for example, for the, for the TIGs, if you didn't come in the Hawaii pavilion with your basic cost, and I'm talking about your basic cost, not just buying the booth, what you need just to step on the floor and set up is about $5,000. Um, that doesn't include your airfare, doesn't include your hotel, doesn't include anything else. Um, and it sounds like it's expensive. There are much more expensive shows out there. Uh, the Food Ex show, if you didn't do the Department of Agriculture, you'd be paying close to $7,000 for a standard booth. And I'm talking about the little white-walled ones. I'm not talking about anything fancy. You know, that costs extra. Okay? Um, I've been to a lot of events in Moscone, and I see what some of those guys put up for their booths. Um, 7000 is nothing at Moscone for, for the fancy food show. I mean, that's pretty much the poverty level. <laughs> you, you're gonna be in the beggar's corner with 7,000. Um, so th there are costs involved uh, to setting up a trade show, but it's an educational process. A lot of guys think they have to go out there and they have to be it, you know, when I'm just all there ready for the trade show. It doesn't work like that. You learn as you go, you get better as you go. Um, I have a rule of thumb for Japanese trade shows and companies joining uh, the TIGs, and it's a three-year rule. Okay. You will not know what you're doing until you hit the third year. You will not know if you're successfully selling anything until about the third. You might find customers, but do you know what you're doing? Okay. And you can, we have general rules of, of how, pretty much general rules what applies of how you should be doing things, but everybody's experience is different at a trade show. Your customers are different. How you set up your sales, your logistics are all going to be different. Okay. So you've got to kind of take them into consideration and you learn as you go. I, this is really bad of me, but I always tell companies, if you're just going to go to Japan on a one-shot deal to see if you're gonna get customers, I'm telling you, go save your money. Go to Vegas, throw it, throw it on the crap table. You got a better chance at a return. If you're not invested to progress in the market, you shouldn't be there, okay? Um, Japan is, a, um, Jimmy's my poster boy, okay? Um, Jimmy came in the first year, and um, he, was, he was well prepared, went in, and he got no sales to that first food egg show. You know, nothing. And, but he learned a lot. He came in, in the second year, and he got a few smatterings. In the third year, he started picking up major accounts. Okay? And his product wasn't his primary sale. His, he was selling the, um, the barbecue sauces, and, but he sold it as a component to somebody else's sauce. They wanted to use that as part of another sauce um, recipe. But that progressed now, they're using his sauce. And it's, it's a large chain, and it's getting more and more interesting. But these things kind of, where you intended to go from year one is not, might not be where it ends up in year three. But you've got to be cognizant. You've got to know what your product is doing. Okay, um, but cost for shows, it's, um, you have to be ready for it. Okay, um, you, you can be frugal. You don't, you don't have to spend, spend everything. But it costs money to do international trade show. Okay? If you're not financially prepared, um, come and talk to us about it. Okay, there's ways you can participate a little bit you know, more reasonable, but you've got to be committed. I, if you're not committed, I don't think you should be investing in the market. Good point. Anybody have anything to add about cost? Cost that you found that you didn't anticipate ahead of time? <laughs> we get costs. <laughs> All of us, yeah, all of us who predicted, we've all got costs that we didn't figure on. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> yeah. His idea of bringing the bailing wire and the multi-tool, you know, yeah. 
Um, I, was, I did a trade show years ago in Korea um, where the organizers for the show were so green. Uh, we got into the booth to set up and the paint was still wet. And the show was gonna open in six hours. Okay, so we couldn't hang anything. We could, so we were, we were jerry-rigging things. Uh, in the Beijing show, which was uh, our kind of a strange show, this is way back in the day, um, we actually had to go behind and steal wire <laughs> to jury rig our boots. Um, it was very interesting. It was very, but you've, you've got to be kind of, uh, you've got to MacGyver some things sometimes. You've got to be prepared for it, yeah. Have you ever? Just one, way to, one way to cut costs is not to exhibit at all. Uh, when you're starting out, if you haven't seen one of these huge monster shows, go visit a show. They're, they're almost all of them are free to get in. Yeah. I mean, some of them will claim to be trade only. Uh, show them a business card in your trade. No problem. Uh, but go, 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 go visit the show. You can do the market research side of things at that point uh, and do, you know, study the catalog and all of that. Uh, and you know, once you get to know the show, may be the time to go back as an exhibitor. You know, one one of the one of the problems that we had um, in Japan Japan's relatively easy for us because um, we've got access to Neil. We have a good distributor over there. Um, we can refer questions and all that um, to him. But we've also participated in shows. I mean, not, not even outside of this country, but on the West Coast. And first thing they ask you is, how are you going to get your products to us? Um, without, without having that lined up, um, you know, that pretty much made the show a wash. And um, same for um, markets outside of, um, you know, the U.S., like Australia. We went down there, and they loved our products. But then again, we had no logistical way to get it to them. Um, one of the things that we are working on right now is actually manufacturing some of our products on the West Coast. So we will have access to better distribution on the West Coast and also access to better shipping routes from the West Coast to these other markets. So um, I think lining up the logistics first before just showing up and hoping you sell something, um, would that's something that I would revisit, you know, in my own experiences. So it sounds overwhelming. It is. Uh, so we we got a customs agent to help us with all of the logistics because it, it depending what you're exporting, it can be a nightmare. So you know, I would suggest looking into uh, custom agents if uh, that's not your strong point. And there are a lot of hidden costs, and I always make sure whenever wherever I go, I know what type of stores are around there, and I look for the dollar store to buy all the extra stuff I need to fix my booth up. Because believe me, you need to fix your booth up. No matter how much you pack, you probably forgot something. <laughs> yeah. Now, going off of um, commitment, I think that was really good. I was also sitting in the same seat as you, and I was told a three-year rule, which set my expectations. And it was really good, because then I knew not to count on everything year one. But then I also knew if I'm signing up for this, are you willing to sign up for at least three years? And then after that, if you find out, like, hey, I really don't like this. This is not our market, then go ahead and quit. But give yourself a chance, and you can't do it in one year. Um, that was great, because that made me realize the cost was going to be more than one year. Um, just for an example, the first trade show I went up and um, everybody had photos. I had no photos or posters ever of our product. And I was running to FedEx and trying to find a FedEx. I spent any free time that I thought I was going to be shopping, um, doing stuff like going to FedEx, figuring out how to get a photo printed. Nobody spoke English. I spoke very little Japanese. And we were literally just, I spent, I'm, I want to say like three hours, just like print, size just i'll just take that size and i spent so much money because uh, out of desperation trying to get things done right then and there so kind of planning that you're going to have those kind of costs because i i still don't have it <laughs> together i think that's why i'm on the panel um to tell you that i still don't have it together but if i'm willing to commit then 
and, and look for what other people are doing. That's why I come to these things, because I'm picking people's brains like Jimmy or Small Business Development Center or, um, or Neil. I'm always calling Neil and saying, how does this work? <laughs> um, yeah, how do you get it there? I just got people asked for things, and I was like, that's great. And they're like, can I buy it? I was like, oh, I'm not sure. I, I don't know how to sell it. So having all those things lined up, and even if you don't, you got to start somewhere. So just participating. I love that advice about just going, going and taking notes and just seeing it and then seeing if that's for you or not. You can go. I, in my marketing, the marketing course I teach, I recommend just going, as Steve said, the first year. If you have some show, you can get a discount air ticket, stay at an Airbnb, eat at the cheap ramen shops or whatever you want to do. And the whole trip might cost, will be less than $1,000, right? And it's really worth it to decide, wow, you know, not, this is for me or you could know right away, no, we're not ready for this at all. And then you don't blow $7,000 the next year uh, actually exhibiting product there. But I highly recommend that. Just go check it out. You know, as I said, it's almost every trade show, major trade show in the world will be free to get in and you can register ahead of time online and just take a bunch of business cards and maybe some literature and walk around and just ask what if questions, meaning what if I had this product from Hawaii and, and what if it had these features and what if it cost about this much and you know, just get feedback like that and look around and see what the packaging is like. Um, as Hideki said earlier, if, you, if you're interested in the Japan market, do not underestimate the um, packaging aspect of it. Erin said that uh, people were really complaining about her packaging because it didn't have perfectly 90 degree right angles on the boxes and things like that. And, um, you know, those are things you can notice when you just go to a trade show and look around. Anything you want to add? Any other questions? Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. There's one question online for Hideki, and then, then I'll get to you, Joe. Um, would leather products, such as purses, uh, be part of the agricultural side, or how does that work? No, no, they're manufactured products, and it's not uh, considered as... It's, it's not um, ag products. It's considered as manufactured products, but, um, yeah... Um, Leather is not is a part of uh, ag products, and so t for um, uh, deep sea water and salt, uh, it's considered as mineral. Uh, something out uh, out of the under the ground is not um, ag products. It's not considered as ag products. Thank you, uh, Joe. Oh, in front of Joe. Um, for Japan market, would it be? Let me repeat the question for the online audience. For the Japan market, is it better to get your story onto in the Japanese language onto literature or onto posters in the Japanese language? So you look familiar. Have you ever been to any of my marketing talks? Then you already know the answer. Uh, Jap Japanify that bad boy as much as you can. Uh, get it Japanese as much as you can. And my experience, and I just got back from this very long junket around the Pacific where I was teaching some export classes to places like Guam and Saipan and Tinian and uh, Marshall Islands and all of this. And I'm so convinced after being in Hawaii and then visiting those places too, that the products that are going to do really well from an island-based economy that is going to have shipping issues. There's no way around the fact that you have to ship these products from the middle of the ocean to some place that's not in the middle of the ocean. That the, the products and services that will do really well are the ones that are unique and they're already relatively expensive. They're a premium product and they can absorb 
some of that shipping cost already because the customer understands they're going to pay more for that product anyway. If you're trying to compete with a product from the Philippines or from China or even domestically in Japan, it's very, very difficult for you to compete on price. And you have to bake into the product all of the aloha and the natural ingredients and all, all of this that comes with um, being made in Hawaii and get that product on the street in Japan or in Seoul or in Dubai. And if it costs 25% more or it costs 50% more or maybe 100% more, that's okay as long as you're able to get your story, your story and the product story, the company's story and all the aloha, if you're able to get that story into the local language, man, I, I, it's just going to sell. It just will sell, right? Do you guys want to add anything to that? Okay, well, well, yeah, he's absolutely right on that point. Um, the one thing I'll throw in there is that a lot of times in Hawaii, you can get things English translated into Japanese. But literal translations sometimes are very, very awkward, OK? It's just like somebody want to somebody who writes ad print ad copies here. Um, you can get somebody who can write English and just do the copy for you. You can get a professional who knows how to word it, who knows how to phrase it, um, and there is a difference. Um, I don't expect my Japanese isn't good enough to actually read through all of that, uh, but my agents in Japan can go in like, "Well, that's kind of strange," um, you know. Um, so again, it's a learning process. Um, I couldn't recommend anybody here who can actually write that way, but I'm sure there are. You might actually want to ask the Department of Agriculture. There might be some people here. Um, some of the guys who are in the, the, um, the Japanese uh, print industry in Hawaii for the tourist magazine and stuff, they might have a good. Um, DOA might actually have some resources on that. Um, but it's, it makes a difference. Um, I've noticed post posters in and of themselves is a visual. Um, and you, if you're marketing a foreign product, a lot of my, a lot of my um, agents in Japan say, well, they want, it, you want to project that it's imported. So you want that poster maybe to have the Japanese on uh, the English name on it, but your explanations much easier read in Japanese. Japanese can read a lot of English, they just don't like to, and they're not going to exactly figure out everything that if you're too complicated or too wordy on your explanations, they might not understand it. Okay, uh, keep it simple. It's like any other sales point. You want to hit your points quickly. Huh? If you remember from marketing. My mantra about the marketing topic is make it as simple as possible for your customers to buy from you. And if the, at the very basic level, Japanese will want it in Japanese, right? It's just sort of fundamental. Koreans will want it in Korean and Germans will want it in German. Can some of those people read English? Yeah, but they don't want to, right? I mean, if I'm buying a, uh, I don't know, Sony TV, I don't want to read the ad in Japanese. I want to go to Best Buy and read it in English, right? I mean, it's just the reverse, right? All right. Sir. For those that sell food products overseas, um, is there a requirement generally to translate the traditional facts and whatnot on the packaging? Um, for Japan, it's a little different. Um, you have to. When your importing agent registers your product for importation, you send them all your information in English. But the importer is required to put on a separate sticker on every individual package with that translated information. Um, is that true for the trade show as well? Um, if you're going to do a, a trade show in Japan, unless you get food clearance, you can't sample, technically, you can't sample the product. It isn't approved for public, for public consumption. Um, I've, I've, I've just finished three companies who are going to TIGS for the first time. I've got their food approvals. We started about a month ago. Um, but there's a process. Uh, some products are really easy to clear, and some, pro some products are really difficult, depending on what the ingredients are. Um, so I encourage people, let us know way ahead of time. Uh, in the TIG setup, and even for most of the DOA setup, we're really lucky. We've got good importers, food importers in Japan who will assist us just for the trade shows. They'll actually take your product in, get the custom broker set up, get, get the registrations done for you, and they'll charge to you at cost, uh, or and with a small markup. Um, what does that roughly cost? It depends on product. I've seen simple products go for like $200 for a clearance, up to $3,000 per product. 
depending on what kind of lab testing. Uh, Japan Ministry of Health, Japan Customs requires lab testing. You've got to send products up for their lab testing. Um, uh, so they'll, they'll test for it. And products like honey, honey is very difficult because there's a lot of restrictions on honey. Um, and Hawaiian honey has a very strange quality to it. Our natural sugar bricks counts are abnormally high to the point where the Japanese think it's artificially spiked honey. And it took years to explain to them that that's how naturally sweet Hawaiian honey is. And they wouldn't believe it for years. Because in Japan, there was a big scandal of people adding sucrose to the bees' feed to, to spike the honey counts. And they thought we were doing it too. And there's antibiotic counts that you have to do with honey. There's a lot of certified lab testing you have to send. So the process gets very expensive for some items. In general, most products are OK. I would say 200 to three, four hundred dollars per product. Sometimes it can be even less. It just depends. A lot of times I think it's uh, which agent actually picked up your document on the other side. And you know, you don't want the rookie kid who's trying to make points with his boss, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I, yeah. So if I had dry mix formulas to send to Japan and it take to a trade show in Japan, and they're different flavors, would they inspect all of them? Any product. Even though the ingredients are similar? If they're different flavors, your flavorings are different. You're going, to have, you're, going to, you're going to have to give documentation for every individual product. Okay. Yeah. Pick, um, pick the, fir, the top one or two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, flavorings for Japan market, you have to be a little careful because most US, US flavorings are illegal in Japan because of a component called the ethylene glycol. Right, right, right. right? Okay. So if, um, and that's what they're looking for. Okay, well, there's none of that in my product. Yeah. And so they, they, they're going to ask you to write it out and that kind of stuff. They're very, good about that. Uh, American products have less of a hassle than a lot of other products. But if you just happen to be wrong place, wrong time, when they're specifically targeting certain types of flavorings, or yeah, it, it could get kind of bogged down. Yeah. Uh, responding to the, the question on, on product labels, uh, I assume they still have it. The US Department of Agriculture uh, through their Foreign Agricultural Service, used to have a program where they would get your label checked out. It was a free program. Um, I'd, I'd, ch I'd check with the uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, see if they still do that. Uh, for industrial products, uh, the Foreign Commercial Service, which is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, does not have a formal program, but most of their offices and embassies overseas will be uh, be happy to take a look at your label and give them give you their their opinion. And they happen to have a local office uh, uh, here in the Foreign Trade Zone. Yeah, that's John Holman. M many of you have met him before. His office is over there. I, Steve reminded me of a good point. It's in my slides earlier, but I didn't specifically cover this point. Um, when you travel to another country, you're going to a trade show, I would highly recommend you go to the embassy, ahead of, make an appointment ahead of time with the commercial service officers there, and go there and explain what you're all about and what you're trying to accomplish. And they're very, very helpful people. Just two days ago, I met with the commercial service in um, Japan and about some different products and things, and extremely helpful people. And um, Korea, China, wherever you're going, set that up ahead of time. All of these major embassies will have U.S. commercial service officers there. And I can tell you, they really like working with small companies because they feel like it's kind of a partnership. Whereas you can imagine if General Motors or Boeing comes into the embassy, it's not the same relationship, right? As a small company from Hawaii, they'd be so excited to see you come in there and talk about things. And uh, it's it's a great asset to have on your side. You never know when, when you could need them for something. Sir. Yeah, I just want to have a final question. You mentioned earlier about the uh, Tokyo's Expoy study tour. Mm -hmm. Is your office organized? Yes, we are. If you visit our website, I'll, I'll give you the information after this session. Um, we are still recruiting companies. Actually, we're still recruiting companies for the Tokyo International Gift Show. We have 
uh, one or two more booths left, so if anyone is interested, please see me after this meeting. Sir? I'm interested in maximizing my trip to Tokyo, and I'm wondering about reaching out to prospective business partners and business customers before I arrive. Would you recommend that? And if so, should I hire somebody locally or find somebody in Japan to try to help me cold call local businesses in Japan to maybe set up my Oh, I highly recommend that um, to maximize your trip over there. What's your product? Um, in the art business, art prints and merchandise, t-shirts, hats, printed imagery. There's a few companies that I know from Hawaii that are in similar type of business. And um, yeah, I highly, highly, highly recommend you try to figure that out. There are people you can hire in Japan to do that for you. I would recommend that rather than somebody here. Um, you, I don't know if you guys feel differently about that, but it's just easier for them to do it, right? Working in their time zone and what have you. Um, in Tokyo, is Tokyo your main market or were you, you're going to TIGS or? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, the US Commercial Service offers the this uh, gold key service, um, which you do have to pay for, but they will help you find partners, distributors, or customers. Um, and if you were getting funding from the High Step program, you could use some of that funding towards the gold key service. Is that that's correct? And, and with gold key, uh, essentially, the embassy, the embassy is uh, is doing the cold call for you, because uh, they will they will give you essentially a, a list. In some cases, they will actually set up the appointments for you with companies who have said, "Yeah, I'm interested in talking to this guy from Hawaii." So they've they've gotten you that far. For a company your size, it's less than a thousand dollars, I think, right? Yeah, something like that. Uh, it just reminded me of one other topic that I wanted to cover. Terry brought it up earlier in her presentation early on about ask, being able to ask for the sales, being able to ask for money when you're at a trade show booth, trying to finish a deal. Not everybody is cut out for that, right? And you don't want to send staff to a booth that is not there to sell the product, right? You have a limited exposure, a limited time to be in front of the customer, and you need somebody who can ask for money, right? Let's let's finish this deal, and understand that ahead of time, Terry. When you say not everybody's cut out for that. So here's a tip. So they said three-year investment, right? So the first year you go, you get translators that live in Japan. So the thing that I do is um, I meet them. So the first time I went, we had shared translators, so meaning they had to help everybody in the pavilion, not just you. So of course I met with all the, they're mostly women, told them my story, told them about our products, gave them omiyage, you know, you have kids, well here's a gift for your kids, you know, what are you doing, why are you here? Really take an interest in them, and then I kept that connection with them, and they were like my side sales agents when I left Japan. So, you know, really be authentic. When I say the Aloha spirit, really take that to heart. And then when you work with the people in Japan, they love Hawaii. They want to help you. So when you come over to Hawaii, look me up. We're going to go lummy lummy massage together. I mean, you know, but be authentic. But they were one of my best um, people to help me make uh, arrangements. So like I said, I wanted, whenever I brought product, it wasn't samples, it was actual inventory from my line. So I wanted to sell it. I never want to take stuff back because it's just a waste of uh, money. So they'd help me pre-sell that. So after the show, I already had a buyer lined up at a discount to take my inventory off my hands. So again, when you, their first year, be really smart, uh, really connect with people. You'll probably find a few people that you like. I know Neil used to tell me, Hey, why is all the translators going to your booth? There's a reason. <laughs> it wasn't bribes, it was because I had the Aloha spirit. 
But just to let you know, Terry, when she does a trade show, I never saw this before. She is so set in her booth. She actually had a little fan tucked underneath the counter to blow cold air. <laughs> I've never seen that. And she's like, oh, this is my standard. I'm going like, oh, she's a pro. That's <laughs> Yeah, That's and the refrigerator. Cool. She had a little refrigerator. Oh, yes. I should tell you, if you're going to be involved in U.S. pavilions and Hawaii pavilions, they tend to be much more, U.S. government money is much more conservative than, say, like the German government money or the French government money. That Those pavilions will have wine and beer to bring in uh, visitors. And we almost can never do anything like that. You can't use any US government or state tax money to buy alcohol and things like that. But you will find that the other pavilions will be very attractive to people um, because they have things like that going on, right? It's fun to visit those pavilions, but. Okay, any more questions? Commenting on his own. Wanted to maximize his time with the uh, with the other meetings. Um, that that's something that um we we definitely do. Um, but that's something we get help from our distributor with. Um, so generally he'll he'll set up the meetings and then in in Japan it's actually wonderful because then they take you out to dinner and it's a really good dinner. But um, <laughs> but um, but anyways, yeah. So the distributor has been instrumental in helping me set up. Like you just let him know, okay, I'm going to be here for this trade show, and then he'll set up meetings with these guys, and then. Um, that's that's actually where most of our bigger sales transactions have happened. Um, you know, it's maybe a small company like just going for maybe the first time though. They don't have a distributor and what have you. And that's also something I think we should talk about just very briefly before we wrap up. Is when you're going to these shows for the first time, uh, some of the people that might come up and contact you are people who say, "Hey, I really like this. I want to sell this product in Japan." I want to be your exclusive agent or whatever. And you really have to take all of that with a grain of salt. You know, don't commit to all of that. You, you're talking about um, uh, working with a potential important partner like that for the next several years, and you don't want to make that decision quickly on the fly. Um, you really need to f do your due diligence and um, figure out if those agents or distributors are really what's good for you and what's good for your product. Do you have any comment about that? So we didn't know anybody in Japan and to get a distribution or anything. We were just testing when we first went. So what I did was everybody that marketed from Hawaii to Japan, I, I looked up. So if there was a magazine that had Hawaii product in it that had, was also in Japanese, I went to that publishing agent. So through due diligence, I found people in Hawaii that were marketing Japan that would travel back and forth. And that's where I met a lot of people um, that were interested in the market. And that's where we worked together with people in Hawaii. And then he introduced me to people in Japan. So the next time, like the second time I went, you know, every night we had dinners lined up. You got to know how to do karaoke. You, you got to bring lots of money to pay for the sushi. But it, it paid off. But it all started in Hawaii. So before, that's, that's why it's so important, do your research. Before you leave, if you don't have connections in Japan and you don't have that big of a budget, look for people who already are working with Japan. And they're more than happy to help you. You might pay a little bit extra, but it's worth it. Just a historic comment. And, um, uh, I lived in Japan for 20 years. And back in the 90s, DBT had a Japan office focused on helping companies uh, market or come to Japan and arrange for meetings. But that office shut down by the late 90s. And it was always in um, uh, conflict with, with the uh, Hawaii Business Bureau and HTA because they're trying to promote visitors. And uh, DBED and T and I see all of you from the last uh, 10 years that the rise of interest in Japan from small companies that didn't exist before, I think, 20 years ago. And again, I think it would be a good idea to think ahead. Uh, and I know it's really expensive for a one-person, two-person uh, office in Japan that really helps Hawaii small business. That's it. One last question about your thing. If you're going to, um, like I said, there's a lot of different ways to set up to set up business business in Japan. If you're going to set up these um, um, cold call meetings, you set up meetings to get 
just be sure you have all your materials and information and pricing set. Uh, because it's kind of hard when you, the Japanese are very well organized. So if they see a product you like, you should have your price list, your, your cost, what your units of sale are going to be. Or you may not have to quote it uh, at, uh, up front, but you have to know how to get the information quickly. So a little bit of preparation before you get up there. I get a lot of guys who actually go to trade shows really green. And I hate to say it, they were kind of Hawaiian style and just kind of winged it. They, they, thought it was, they thought it was a made in Hawaii show. And when customers came up there, they got great orders. After the show, they come to me, how do I send it to these guys? I'm going, didn't, we told you to set up before. He goes, well, I didn't expect people were going to order like this, you know, pallets and pallets. Actually, it was a company who did Hawaiian printing, uh, printed uh, greeting cards. And he expected little small sales. He was getting pallet loads of orders. Um, and he didn't know how to ship it. So after the show, we had to kind of help him and, and get it all set up. Now he's pretty much independent. But um, yeah, just that kind of awkwardness, you, you, you've got to try to get a little bit of prep done before you step into it. Um, I, when I talk to my TIGS guys in the afternoon, yeah, that's, that's kind of a lot of what we're going to go over with the new companies. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, I wanted to ask, is there like a guide that you folks have online about all of this? Because there's just so much information that we can't <laughs> okay. F funny you should ask. Um, at, at the Hawaii Pacific Export Council, we will record these seminars, and then event after some days of editing, we put it up on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and watch all of this here. Now, that being said, we do not have an export guide from Hawaii in written format, but that's something I'm actually working on. Um, trying to put together a booklet of resources and just general information. But that's an ongoing project, and I, it, it won't be done for another six months or so. Um, as a, I'll just show you if I have it in my case here. I was just on Guam, and I was really surprised that they have this Guam export guide. And I was talking to them about this idea I had about making a Hawaii export guide. And they said, oh, hang on a minute. Let me show you something. And they came out with this. I thought, how can they can have that on Guam? We can't have that here. So um, I'm working on something. Check it out. It's pretty impressive. Um, so I'm working on something like that. But it'll, like I said, it's at least six months away. But this is a tremendous resource, in my opinion. Um, please look on, at some of the information there. Right now for Guam with what we've said so far. After the meeting, is there someone I can talk to um, as far as protecting what it is I'm doing? Yeah, we can talk about it. But remember, it's not an export. It's not an export. No. Because okay. Guam is U.S. territory. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now we're also going to be taking it to Japan. That's an export. Okay, that's an export. So who would I speak to you? Yeah, we, we can oh, help you. That. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. we can help you. Any final comments? If not, then what I'd like to do, just make sure real quick, I'll pass the microphone down to the end. Terry, can you explain to the people about Patsy Mink and how maybe they, can, you, they could help? And then um, Jimmy and Aaron, remind people how to get your products and where they can get it. And, and I thank you so much for being here. I want to make sure you promote your products. So I'm from the Patsy T. Mink Center for Business and Leadership. We are the only women's business center here in the state of Hawaii. We're funded in part by the Small Business Administration and a program under YWCA Oahu. So our goal is really to help uh, women and men start, grow, and lead in their business. Uh, we do free business counseling. Uh, we do free legal counseling. We have many workshops and programs to help you along in your business. So um, it's a great resource to have, and we're partners with um, a lot of the people here today. So check us out. I have brochures at the front of the uh, table. Thank you. Um, so um, <clears throat> so you can actually, so I'm with the Hawaiian chip company, Kilway Fire. Um, we have uh, statewide uh, distribution. You can find our products in um, Safeway, Longs, Times, and all that. But um, actually, one of the learning um, uh, things that one of the things I learned in uh, some of my experiences with Japan, I told you how 
I decided we're not going to be able to compete on packaging and whatnot, and we're not going to, you know, do individually wrapped um, chips or anything like that. But what I learned is that they also value fresh, really fresh product. So we actually opened up our own retail store at um, at um, down in Kalihi, and you can actually come down and get the chips made fresh to order. So they're still hot, and you put your own seasonings on, and um, somebody told me, hey, McDonald's is copying you. You know, they got their season their own fries. And I'm like, you know, I actually got that idea from McDonald's Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so come on down. And then I, I just want to say, you know, as someone who's grown, um, I, I don't know where you guys are at in your businesses. Um, you know, um, if you're bigger businesses or you have, you're well-funded or whatnot, but I basically grew my business from, selling at the um, craft fairs and trade shows and swap meets here in Hawaii. And, um, you know, it's just something to really evaluate um, as far as how much how much effort you want to put towards how much energy you want to expend um, projecting your business. And then also, how much business is there still right here? I mean, you know, you got to think about how you're working hard every single day here. So trying to show up somewhere else one day a year and expecting that to buy the house in Kahala and the new Toyota Tacoma truck, well, you know, it's, you know, it's a stretch. So I still live in Kailua, and, uh, you know, one day, one day. <laughs> um, again, I'm Erin from Shokolea. So we uh, have a retail store, and our kitchen is all in Manoa. Some of our products can be found at uh, Nime Marcus and the Moana Surfrider Hotel, but majority of it is made fresh in Manoa. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Shokolea Hawaii. We're posting like every so many hours uh, <laughs> on Instagram. But our mission is bringing peace to our world one chocolate at a time. Uh, so that determines what businesses, adventures I decide to take, which ones are too costly, which ones are not worth my time because I also want to enjoy my life uh, with my family and my business, um, it's all integrated. And so that uh, determines what I do and what I don't do. So knowing my mission, uh, knowing your mission, I think will help you decide if trade shows are for you, what country, when, and if not, then that's okay too. Can you just remind people how to find you? Okay, uh, yes, my name is again Hideki Yamane from the Market Development Branch at Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Actually, I forgot to mention one thing um, for you. Um, since this is a high-step focused program, uh, we have another uh, federal uh, support for you, uh, small companies, uh, which is um, uh, USADA Fund Much Program. USADA stands for Western United States Agricultural Trade Association. That is funded by USDA for uh, international marketing. So uh, basically, they have a 50% reimbursement program. So they pay 50% uh, of your airfare, uh, lodging fee, and also the boost cost overseas, and also the translation cost to you know uh, tr translate your um, brochures to for example Japanese language or Korean language so um, if you're interested in um, joining the program please uh, contact me thank you uh, um, 808 973 9593 thank you yes okay so I'm Neil Arakaki uh, for the purposes of this, I'm with Jaxi Corporation, which is just me. I'm actually the president of Menuhuni Mac Chocolates, so I'm the product of child slave labor family business. Um, uh, I, I, I have an unusual, the reason why I do Japan is because we've had an unusual history with Japan. I've been doing trade shows in Japan for 37 years. Okay. Child slave labor, I'm, I'm not joking. Okay. Uh, we, my company was actually bought by a major Japanese corporation. Uh, two major Japanese corporations, multi-billion dollar corporations, and we worked under them for almost 14 years, and they sold the company back to us when the bubble crashed. But in that time, I got to work inside of Japanese corporations, food companies. Um, so I got, to, I, I got lucky enough to see what the inside mechanism is and the outside mechanism, which is why I kind of bring a different insight. But when I do these shows, I look at it from the manufacturer's perspective. I don't set up booths, and here's, here's your booth, and you go. That's, it doesn't work for anybody. Okay. But Menuhuni Mac. Waikamilo Road, we've got a little good. We used to be everywhere in Longs, if some of you old timers remember. I've withdrawn most of my product from wholesale. Um, so you can find us in Neiman Marcus, right next to their stuff, um, and in a few stores. But we're basically working out of our little store. Uh, we're the largest handmade chocolate operation left in the country. 
plant capacity is about a million pounds a year, one piece at a time if we cranked it up. But you got to come down. Free samples. Come down. Eat the free samples. Thanks. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.